Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of people to thank. This isn't the Oscars, so I won't, but <laughs> obviously Tim and Kitty, and uh, we were working in, um, in a little house not far from here. A lot of people walked in. Uh, the meetings were very well attended. Actually, there was a little report that one of them wasn't, and I said, what meeting was that? We always packed the rooms. Um, uh, it was very well organized. Whoever did it, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, last night, I left uh, my wonderful team to finish, and we went to a bar in King Street. And three gentlemen walked in, the past, the present, and the future. <laughs> it was tense. The problem is that there's a great deal of tension here, and it is between the past, the present, and the future. And that's where it comes from. You know, finally, it becomes clear, and people are in different versions of time, not place. We all know what the place is, or at least approximately, but the time frame that people are discussing is very different. There are people who are older, and people who are younger, and people who are very young, and they have very, very different uh, issues with Charleston. Extremely, I mean, that alone should engage everybody who cares about Charleston, is the generational prospects. There is a, some argument, not a lot, as you will see, about which is the area of concern, which is a historic, beautiful place, the place that has prospects. You should know that my area of concern is usually the suburbs, the suburban sprawl. My area of concern is usually what I'm not talking about at all today. It's what's going on in the suburbs. I'll show you a map. It's quite scary. And there are not enough people taking care of it uh, in South Carolina. In fact, I was meeting with Victoria Beach yesterday, and we were trying to get some small things done. You know, a little this, a little tinkering with a corner people, uh, people were unhappy with, somebody was unhappy with. And it turns out a community of 4,500 units had just been laid out in a pure suburban pattern on delicate land somewhere else. So uh, we have to really focus in. And basically, what you must realize is that what looms very large here, the problems that loom, loom very large, are really very small. And this place, Charleston, historic Charleston, is actually doing spectacularly wor well. It hasn't done so well in a very long time. Uh, your uh, very great mayor has actually, and I think all the people who've contributed, and by the way, the many organizations that are continually showing up, there's an infinite number of organizations, have really been effective. And this is not a place that's in trouble. Okay? So when you see this presentation, if you don't agree with it and you don't do what I say or what we say, it's okay. You'll still be okay. Do you understand the problem we have here? I'm working in a place that is not genuinely in crisis. Crisis wonderfully focuses the mind. You know, we go to cities that are in the emergency room, and they really listen. What is going on here took me a while to understand, which is simply an aspiration to be greater, to be better than ever. It's really what it is because I was stood in front of one building after another, and I said, what's the problem? I'd be happy to have one of these buildings in one of my projects. Like, what is the problem? What's going on? The complaints are very minor. So actually, in some ways, I've had to adjust, and I ask you to adjust, okay, to what might seem to be very, very minor problems. Now, at the same time, before I adjust to what's actually my job, my job, was our job was to take the BAR and make certain that the architecture that comes through that process is, a good, is as good as it can be. I'm not even saying that it's not good enough. Okay? It may not be good enough. And that was our task, a little task like this. A small percentage of our conversations took place on that subject. It immediately got bigger. And that's because everything is attached to everything else. So I'm going to begin by speaking of four or three or four things that you really need to do and that are outside our purview. The most insidious, as I walk around Charleston and I see your shops and your houses and I see how your doors open, and not only that you've preserved your outside buildings, but you've preserved your streetscapes, 
you know, your sidewalks and your narrow streets and your old stairways and that your old buildings are in use, not only outside, but the inside is very often preserved. That is because you have been getting some very, very good interpretations by your regulators. Okay, the people who, who, uh, who oversee the accessibility codes, the people who oversee the fire codes, the people who oversee the electrical codes, the exit codes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, understand very well that this is a delicate and complex place and that you cannot interpret it just straight from the table. That the table says X, therefore you have to you know, tear out the storefront and do it right or put in a ramp that completely consumes the sidewalk or tear out half your, your, uh, your, uh, the square footage in your little shop to make some enormous double handicapped bathroom. You've been getting wonderful interpretations by what I would consider to be uh, Mayor Riley's people. Okay, it's a very humane old guard that really understands Charleston. Mayor Riley is going to go or come, things are going to change. What you need to fear is that the regulators who replace, the younger regulators, will come in and interpret very, very rigidly. And that's when you're going to lose Charleston. You're going to lose the character of Charleston. I see it everywhere else. Because the codes of the present are not the codes of the past. This was written, a lot of what you see here is the electrical code or the codes of 1974 or 1944. And you can continue living under those codes all you like. But the minute you renovate, the new code kicks in. And we have an incredibly awful new code called the International Building Code that is about gold plating everything. It's the New Jerusalem. <laughs> there shall be no lines to the bathrooms. You shall plug 40,000 appliances into a small house. Every level shall be accessible. Three storms can hit simultaneously and you won't flood. <laughs> Do you understand the problem? This is achievable in new places. It is not achievable in this place. The new code, even the new International Building Code, has tables, but it also has mitigating language on which it is embedded. That mitigating language in each chapter is where the discussion took place before the table was written. And people would say, hey, what about a, basically, what about a city like Charleston? How do we work with a city that's old and like this? And there's mitigating language with the tables. And experts know the mitigating language, and that's how they build things. But if you get new regulators, they will only go straight to the table. And they will tell people, you must do this and you'll lose your city. You see, and one of the things I recommend is that there be some real experts coming in, pulling out the mitigating language in all of the regulations that affect your buildings, and daylighting them. So that is what you administer. So you administer, as it were, the loopholes rather than the rigidities. This is not something that comes up for vote. You're not going to say, Let's vote this in or vote this out. This just happens. It's, it's regulatory, it's administrative creep. And the only way you'll know is that 20 years from now, you'll look back and say, the city has no character, what happened? That's what happens, and I see it everywhere. So that's one thing you must do. And I think it's, it's absolutely the purview of the preservation uh, uh, organizations to, to take care that the regulations preserve your city deeply and not just the aesthetics of the surface. Okay, that's one. The second thing, like many cities of your age, many American cities, your code is almost entirely suburban in its origins. It actually envisions suburbia. It envisions motels. It's a 1950s, 60s code that has been patched together. This is your zoning code. That's very common. There is a tendency to reform these codes. You basically have, people have been scratching at it to make it fit Charleston better. But as you remove the counterproductive stuff, I've done it professionally, as you remove the counterproductive stuff and you take the fat and the grist and everything out, and you're looking for the spine, there is no spine. Because that code intended to administer suburbia. What you have is the worst kind of hodgepodge. To give you an example, just one extraordinary example. Your building heights are given by feet, 50 feet. You know what happens when you tell somebody 50 feet? You get six, eight 
foot stories. Six floors at eight feet. Eight foot floors have everything to do with cheap motels and nothing to do with Charleston. It is impossible to work out a facade properly of any kind of dignity and decency, let alone inside, when actually the code automatically pancakes. And all you need to do is adjust that code in a modern way that says five stories. The building is five stories. It doesn't matter if you, if you, can, if you can manage as a developer to build a 10-foot story or a 12-foot story, fine. You should be absolutely rewarded for that. And that's just one little instance of the kind of thing that you need to do. So the second thing you need to do is essentially throw out your zoning code, not for the suburbs, you know, the 90% that's outside, but in here, it's completely counterproductive. The other thing about throwing it out is do not use that as a, do not, the redoing of your code must not become a master plan. A master plan is something else, okay? If you use the redoing of the code to lower densities, say, or to, let's say, interfere with what are perceived for prop, uh, to be property rights, oh yes, well, you know, we're going to now write the new code, and by the way, we're dropping eight stories to four stories, you'll never pass that code. That's a master plan that has to happen independently, okay? Almost every city, including the rather famous Miami 21 that Marina, my partner, did in Miami with Liz, took four years and five million dollars because instead of just cleaning up the code, we had to actually do what everybody wanted, which essentially is down zoning. And it was, it was a horrible experience to so separate those two things. That's the second. Now the third is really very interesting because you have a mayor that works, he has fantastic not political instincts, he has fantastic socioeconomic and cultural instincts. When he lectures, he lectures about people. You know, the, I've heard him speak every a dozen times. And every time, like a dope, he, drives me, he brings me to tears. It's all happened to you. I've seen him lecture in Havana, and he brought the communists to tears. <laughs> about social justice, which is absolutely astounding. So the mayor has an instinct for civic buildings and the tax base that wealth brings and the tax base that tourism brings and also he takes care of people of fewer means. It's built into the man. It's not in policy. Okay? When he goes, you will lose the cultural instinct and you are going to get a political instinct. And the political instinct will not take care of the equilibrium that this city is about to lose. Is about to lose. And I think a lot of the bother that's happening here, some of the debates, has to do with the, in, with the, the people perceive your tendrils are out. This sophisticated Byzantine society here knows that something is wrong. And what's happening is you're losing your equilibrium. And most interestingly, or most obviously, you hear it all the time, is Charleston is now so desirable that it is becoming, huge swaths of it are becoming an economic, economic monoculture. You know, the famous area south of Broad. But what comes with an economic monoculture, which actually is very nice for taxes, is that you also get a geriatric monoculture. Okay, this is a city that is aging terribly because wealth of the kind that it takes to buy the great houses of the South, and now, actually, even the rather mediocre houses further north cost a million dollars at the drop of a hat, right? What you're getting is that wealth usually accumulates with age. And while you have a cohort that still walks around pretty smartly, they begin to totter around. <laughs> and then they begin to be they can't stand anything. They can't stand music. They can't stand, uh, you know. They can't, they, the food smells, you know. And that's where you lose Charleston. Now, what happens is that you're not going to notice it for a really ironic reason. When you walk the streets, it's full of young people. That's because, but that's artificially induced by your colleges. Those people don't live here. 
It's artificially induced. The faculty doesn't live here. The faculty can't afford to live here. They live to the north. So when you walk around, you say, God, there are a lot of young people. And then you walk around and say, what about the middle class? What about the middle people? What about the families? You see them walking around too because of the tremendous tourist load. So you see people of all ages and all income walking around. It's a pure Potemkin village. <laughs> it's like you say, please send me some young people to make a good impression. Okay. So when a project comes up, like the very famous one of the Sergeant Jasper, which was entirely taken up as an aesthetic problem or a traffic problem or a parking problem. What that, the negotiation, I'm not saying don't negotiate at that level, but the negotiation should have taken also, what should have entered the negotiations is, what does this project do in terms of restoring equilibrium? Okay, do we have too many expensive markets? You know, little and ineffective that cause too many people to drive 10 miles. Which is the right market to be there? Instead of, oh my God, traffic, right? What, what is the housing like? Is it really going to be, is it housing for poor people? Is it housing for middle class? Is it housing for rich people? Because what's missing here is the middle class, like the professors of the College of Charleston. You, I know this very well. You will not get a first-rate College of Charleston unless the faculty that you bring here participates in the life of Charleston. Their self-image is not a suburban cul-de-sac. Okay, they want the closest thing to a New England village. I assure you that you offer a Charleston lifestyle to a professor, the kind that you have here, and you can outcompete Middlebury and the best New England colleges. But they have to participate here. You can't just say, come to the College of Charleston, and by the way, try to find a ranch house in the cul-de-sac, because they're going to go somewhere else. Do you understand? It's very important in all sorts of little ways that everything be in equilibrium. So people are driving too much. Got it. I understand. Then why are you requiring parking in the new projects? Has anybody made the connection that the more parking you make available, the more people will drive for things and not consider walking? I've made this point before. It has not penetrated. <laughs> but I want you to think about this while you brush your teeth every morning. <laughs> that if you provide parking, people will tend to take the car to places that they can possibly walk to. And by the way, if they can't walk, if they can't take the car, which permits you to bypass the proximate store, to bypass the closest corner store to get something cheaper or more variety, the corner store will never emerge. So the wished for corner store that you think is being destroyed by the market is actually being destroyed by the provision of cars. Because the hundreds of people that move into this project, if they don't have cars, first of all, two things will happen. If you don't provide cars, you're going to get real Charlestonians, right? Not parasitic suburbanites that want to drive everywhere but happen to like the nightlife. Let them live everywhere else. Okay, that's number one. So you get here, you're not here yet, but you should ask for no parking. Hold the developers. The second thing will happen is the, the apartments will immediately become less expensive because they don't have to build these idiotic, extremely expensive parking garages. And you'll get people that actually can then afford the units better. It'll also permit the units. You hate those big buildings, don't you? Those buildings are driven by the parking that's required because they have to mask the massive parking garage, right? So at the same time, you're telling the developer, provide tons of parking, and we hate the big building. I'm sorry, they come together. Get rid of the parking, and then it can, it, you can have many small buildings. And I'm going to make the case over and over today that the essence of Charleston is not architectural style, it's small buildings. And you can tell from the beginning that every style known to man exists here. By the way, mostly not great architecture. That should be good news to you. <laughs> that actually this, this, this city survives despite a kind of absence of great architecture, but the essence of it 
is actually the very, very small buildings. You know, the King Street small buildings. Even the mansions are small. You have the least pretentious mansions in the world because they present themselves narrow to the street. They're huge in depth. Boy, if you had to face one of these things on the battery, you'd say, who was this English lord? But no, they present themselves modestly to the front. And so the essence of Charleston is actually this small building. You're absolutely precluding that with a large garage. See, so you see what I'm saying? Everything is attached to everything else. The other thing, and this is a sub-story, a, a subspecies, you're beginning to get the preservation movements. The preservation movements are beginning to become the instrument of NIMBYism. If you want a project to not happen, throw the preservationists at them. Right? That is not the job of preservation, and you will disgrace the preservation movement, and it'll eventually be ignored if, they, if that is the vehicle under which you kill projects. You must start other organizations to kill projects, and you can join both. <laughs> but don't taint the name of the preservation organizations with issues that have better to do with NIMBYism. Okay? Because you can see already the number of environmental organizations in this country that people are ignoring and are absolutely on the defensive because they're in the thrall of NIMBYism. All over Florida, false, falsely designated rare species are used to fight development. It's not really a rare species. The species is all over the place. So, and so what happens is eventually there are interventions, legal interventions, and, pre and, and environmentalism gets a bad name. Don't let preservation get a bad name. Separate the necessary nimbyism, or the nimbyism if necessary, from the preservation movement. They're two different, use different instruments. As I said, belong to both, but don't, don't use the initials to stop things, because you're gonna need the prestige, the incredible, ineffable prestige of the preservation movements to actually do a lot that needs to be done here. Now, about the preservation movement. Uh, a preservation movement is an instrument to preserve the past. It was uh, to prevent the demolition of Penn Station, to prevent the demolition of the houses. It has transmuted in Charleston to become the vehicle, the BAR, of assuring that the future, that the new buildings fit with Charleston. As somebody said, they're, they're, that they will be worth preserving in the future. That is excellent. That is so interesting. Actually, it was Vincent Scully who said that the revival of traditional architecture, which now allows at least some architects to go to certain schools that teach traditionalism, which of course was absolutely, uh, did not exist you know, in the 1960s or 60s. It had been completely eliminated from education. That, that arose from the preservation movements. So the school that you have here, that is your, the, the school of preservation and the school of craft that you have, that is the vehicle that informs the future for Charleston. Other places that are much more modern in outlook, the dreaded Charlotte, the dread Atlanta, okay? You don't need, the preservationists there have no business projecting the future. But one of the things that makes you unique is that the preservationists here are projecting the future. And that's really fascinating. You know, that, that, that everybody goes through that board, and that board has a duty to actually preserve Charleston's spirit. It's deeply associated with the areas that have been designated for preservation. This might sound so normal to you, it's really interesting. The preservation board projecting a future, and actually preserving the culture. Now let's talk about, about preserving the culture. Liz, before I left, said, don't get into the style wars of architecture. Just talk about preserving the brand. Okay? And that is really modern. Every city needs to be identifiable. There, there's a lot of noise in this world. Every project has enormous advertising budget. Cities has ad have advertising budgets. Cities come up with posters and jingles and festivals and absolutely desperate. They build little clock towers to photograph. They foster festivals to take some photographs to put on a video so that you come there. Okay? These, are, these are cities that don't have enough character to actually have a brand. 
you have one of the greatest brands in the United States. It's top half dozen. San Francisco, Charleston, New Orleans, probably Washington, Boston, etc. It is, it is not the top five, but I would say it's clearly the sixth. Okay? Now, let's talk about that, and that's okay. I mean, you're, not very, you're the smallest of them all. So it's very well done that you have a brand. Now, let's look at what makes your brand. And let me compare it to New Orleans, which is the other city I love. New Orleans has a brand in food, a brand in music, a brand in the kind of parties that they throw, and a brand in how much time they waste, <laughs> which is extremely attractive. <laughs> One of the things that allowed me to think that I was not in New Orleans is that everybody was absolutely on time to every meeting. That's really, that's not so hot. Uh, there is no slack. This is a really seriously hard-working city. New Orleans has a lot more leisure. Okay, it's a different character. And New Orleans has architecture. And music. Did I mention music? Okay, all that. So what do you have left? The music is imported. You have a little bit of folk art left. Thank God there's a school for crafts here. You have, uh, you're beginning to have food, but it's not local food. It's the kind of food, it's excellent. The new restaurants, but you can find it anywhere. Okay, it's, thank God it's not grits and crab cakes. Okay, I understand that. But it's not your brand. In fact, if you go through it, you're, the only brand you have is architecture. You're backed into your architecture. It's the way it looks. It's what it feels like on the streets. It's extremely unique, which makes the issue of architecture not one more thing, but the thing. It's the thing. If you lose that, if you start becoming more like Charlotte, you've really lost a lot. And you, in the future, you will have lost, actually, an asset that people, other cities, countries, people kill for. And here you have it. So I do agree that this place has to be extraordinarily careful about its architecture. Now, let's talk about why I sound a little bit depressed, which I am. You're all slightly depressed. <laughs> Eventually, it comes through. I sound like I know what I'm talking about, because I'm not here hyping anything. I'm kind of saying, well, yeah, it's OK. I saw this so clearly at the one BAR meeting last Wednesday. Uh, uh, last Wednesday there was the, the, the African American Museum that went through. There was a very special condition. There was no question that that was a unique thing. You know, it was a you know, major uh, multi-million dollar institution. That wasn't. But then a building I'm going to show you today, which is this one, came up. This one. And we sat through this. And there were, nobody said anything actually stupid, but everybody was completely demoralized. Uh, the architect presenting had zero energy. Uh, the comments by the board had zero energy. And then finally, before anybody completely fell asleep by the lack of energy, the, uh, the interim chairman said, shall we <sighs> vote, make a motion? And there was a general feeling, well, I suppose we should. I mean, it's the third try. <laughs> OK. And I, I was so devastated that night. I was going out to Kitty. I said, Kitty, I have to get out of here, and I need a drink now. <laughs> and Kitty didn't understand. Kitty, we drove around. Kitty wanted to show me stuff. And I said, eh, let me be polite. Like, I'm not a drinker, but I need a drink now. <laughs> Do you remember, Kitty? Like, I want it now. I was so depressed that a project like this, of many, many, many tens of millions, that was the initial project of the most important campus you were going to, you, you, you were going to have in many generations. You know, this is where the research takes place. This is where the entertainment takes place. That the first building came in, and all you could say, not even did you say, is, I suppose is all right. Okay, and I found that extremely depressing. I was really depressed that night. And then I saw that actually the mayor was right. It's actually not good enough. 
Now, let me bring up an issue that I need to bring up now because it is, I might forget to do it later. Okay, when I met with the architects, the architects really think that Charleston is Dullsville and that the people are very conservative and that the people are asking them to just look at the old stuff and they're desperate to be liberated. And in fact, they've gone to schools el elsewhere, Clemson and other schools, and they're very aware of what's happening all over the world and they're very anxious to bring in all that bright new architecture here. Very anxious to do it. And in fact, one of the people who advises them before they go in front of the board is well known for showing a great number of slides to them about the, uh, the great architecture that's happening elsewhere. That is an excellent idea in a lot of places that don't have their own brand. Okay, that is exactly what you do with Charlotte, which just a little while ago was a two-horse town. That's exactly what you do in any suburban retrofit you do. This would be a spectacular replacement for a dead mall of the many that we're doing into a town center. I'd be so happy to get that building in a dead mall. Okay? But Charleston is different. Charleston cannot be a net importer of architectural ideas. Charleston has to mine <laughs> its own genetic material, which is considerable and sophisticated, and Charleston has to become an exporter of architectural ideas, okay? And, and the world is fascinated by Charleston. All the architects come here, or they all know. Charleston is the greatest influence of my own work, okay? I've designed over 200 new towns, easily 45 are under construction. Not only do the building types, but the streets, the infrastructure that I know, all the stuff I learned right here, here's where I learned my trade walking around. I can tell you the widths of streets. I may not remember the names, but I know exactly what I'm looking at. And when I stand up in front of the manuals and the civil engineers and the people who tell me that density doesn't work or that fire truck can't turn, and I, even as a very young man, I stood up and I said, no, you're wrong. And I was considered very, very arrogant because they had the big book. They had the Georgia Tech degree, you see. And here's a person that said, your, your book is wrong. And the guy's telling me, no, it works. It's because I had seen it with my own eyes in Charleston. That's how I know it works, because I had seen it here. Now, Charleston, if you bring in outside architecture and you bring in outside, by the way, fire marshals, which apparently you have already, <laughs> the first thing that fire marshal did is bring in standards that were not from Charleston. And the next thing, I was looking at the age of your fire trucks, because I'm, you know, I have to look at, I'm like a doctor. You have very old fire trucks. They're little and agile. Okay. When you keep, you keep, don't let them sell them. Okay. Because the new ones are enormous and they will not fit your city. You just keep renovating those fire trucks. Don't buy a new one. The minute you get a new one, it will not only ream out your city, but it will actually prevent the extensions that you want built to actually have anything to do with the city. So it isn't just the buildings and the material of the buildings and the look of the buildings. One of the things that has to be considered is that the street sections, the public space of Charleston, that experience is fully as important as anything else. And some people will say that it's even more important. It's the height to width ratio of King Street. It's the intimacy of the street south of Broad that allow you to walk right down the middle of the street as if the pedestrian owned them. And the books say those streets don't work. And I said, you mean a moving van hasn't come here? Right? Are you going to tell me that trucks don't come, garbage isn't picked up? But the books say no. The books will actually say it doesn't work. So one overlay you need is a series of regulators that are interviewed and I'm talking about the police chief, who does, apparently doesn't understand bicycles at all. <laughs> he considers bicycles a blight. A fire marshal that has no longer allows the building of streets like Charleston's. People who are maniacs about certain trees, nativists or people who want the paved landscape to drain. You know, that kind of person. They're going to make Charleston impossible. 
there's all sorts of new stuff coming down the line that may or may not make sense elsewhere. I happen to think it doesn't make any sense at all in the 21st century. It's all expensive and consumptive of land and entirely too specialized and too high tech. I don't think it makes sense, but for sure it doesn't make sense in Charleston. So what the, preser the preservation board needs to interview everybody that comes in here, the policemen, the people who administer the fire code, the people who administer the building code, because that's where you're going to lose it. It's not the brick that's going to do it. It's this insidious underlying system that is actually where the power lies. And already it's happening. Okay, so that's another agenda you need to do. And by the way, if you were to do this, it would be, if the preservation movement were to do this, all of this is pioneering. This is not, I'm not saying I'm bringing these news from elsewhere, no. This is something in which city after city after city is defeated in this. And that's how they lose their character. And you know how many cities, even the Charlottes and the Atlantas, they used to have nice places and they don't any longer. Okay, that was just the preamble. That's not my job, what I just did. <laughs> but now it's my job. Okay, so these are the preservation. These are the areas of preservation. It's an enormous uh, 2,460 acres. It's one of the largest, uh, it's one of the largest areas, uh, such areas in the world. And it is, this is the map of the date in which they were absorbed. And one of the things that is very telling is that it began like this. This is the date. I can't read the date here, but let's say it was 1930. It's too small there. This is, by the way, the greens are the parks. So this was the first increment, the second increment, the third increment, the fourth increment, the fifth increment, the sixth increment, the seventh increment, etc. By the way, this is what a battlefield map looks like or perhaps the expansion of the British Empire in India, I don't know. <laughs> but what has been happening is that you began very rationally with that which was more, worth preserving, and then you began to worry, and then you worried more, and you took more and more and more in. And that coincides almost exactly with the architectural theories that were ever less sympathetic with traditional architecture. At the beginning, it was just they're knocking them down because they're falling down and we're too poor to fix them. And then later, you began to find, wow, the new buildings are unsympathetic. And I'm sure that if you could, you could take over the rest of the city. The problem is that if you have too much, you administer nothing. And one of the things that came up for discussion, several, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm saying some things out of, out of order for fear that I won't say them at all if I don't say them. There are two things that are considered a problem with the, with the BAR. And one of them is that they're exhausted, that too many projects come up, they stay up too late, and we definitely have to deal with that. The other problem is that there's a new phenomenon called the large building of which you have no precedent. And it's causing a great deal of havoc. And I hear time and time again, we don't have problem with the small houses. They're okay, they're well renovated, etc. but the big buildings are a disaster. And by the way, we're assigning 10 minutes to each the same amount of time for a small renovation and a very large building, and the large buildings are always a disappointment. By the way, I don't think everybody agrees they're a disappointment, but enough do that they want me to focus on that as the problem. Okay? So here's your thing, the 2,690 acres that you're taking care of, and one of the things you hear us do is we have to actually administer this differentially. A little addition south of Broad requires much more attention than a new building north of one of the other streets. Okay, so that's something you're gonna hear us say. This is what, okay, now here's the politics of this. At first I didn't understand this. People ask us, and the architects especially say, we need the freedom to express ourselves. You know, this is, it's a, architecture is a quasi-artistic endeavor. The individual has uh, the right to freedom of expression. It is clearly with a, even a fairly decent and well-intentioned architect's buildings are more interesting. And they want to be allowed in here. And the, the extreme example is the uh, Clemson School. But check this out. Okay, this is the area that the architecture is saying in here, which is the brand, this is the four square miles, you have to behave. 
in the manner of the brand, okay? We are, name your brand, you know, what's a, who makes a good purse these days? Oh, maybe you don't know, this is Charleston. Uh, one of these Italian firms, okay? Uh, that Louis Vuitton, okay, Louis Vuitton, with its stitching and its colors and the way it nails things together, doesn't mess with its brand. It just doesn't mess with it. It's been doing the same thing for 100 years. It puts them forward, but it says, we have a very good thing going here. I would, you, I think, I would consider this the brand. If you want to experiment and compete with Charlotte or anything else, you have the other 90%, okay? So when the, that, that should be very evident. Okay, so I want to say that although I was at first very sympathetic with the, I'm an architect, and I have to, I'm going to credentialize myself a little later. I am very sympathetic with freedom. I think the architects, that this is the field of their action, in perfect freedom. And here, if you're a good Charlestonian, you basically submit to the code because you have to protect the brand. You know, you're working for Louis Vuitton. You've been asked to update the trunk, but you don't erase it and start from the beginning because some hip hop operation in Brooklyn has a new idea on how to do a bag. Okay? <laughs> However cool the bag is. And that's the difference between myself and the traditionalists. The traditionalists actually say, that bag is never cool. You know, the Brooklyn bag and hip hop. And that lifestyle has nothing to do with anything. I'm not saying that at all. I don't agree with that. I think there's an incredible vigor to modern culture as it evolves. It's just that you have this very specific task to defend the brand. And I don't know whether you like that. That might be a little too modern for Charleston, a little too aggressive to talk, even talk about a brand, but that is exactly what's happening in the modern world. And if you don't want to say the word brand, think of it, okay? Think of the brand and just remember this map. And I think that the preservationist should say, why don't you play out here, boys and girls? <laughs> but we've got rules in here. So as I write rules that have become progressively more specific over the next, in the last few days, under pressure of people who want me to write more specific rules. Remember, it's less than five, if not 4% of the land of Charleston. And by the way, if you don't think this is enough, there is the rest of the United States. <laughs> the idea that Charleston should bring in from the outside is defensible in the inaugural condition. And the architects will say, look everywhere. You'll see Victorian stuff, you'll see Georgian stuff, you'll see Elizabethan, you'll see incredibly creative stuff. In the inaugural condition, when, Charleston, when a city starts, you have to bring in material. You bring in people, you bring in people of different races with different roles, you bring in ministers of different kinds, you bring in a lot of stuff. But then you begin educating them yourself and you begin developing your own systems, your own laws, your own everything. That too for architecture. So when an architect says, look at the stuff all around and you see all the variety, that is typical of an inaugural condition in a climax condition that you have. You're like a forest. You're not the climax forest. Preservation is when you realize that the evolution at some point is not going to make it better. And you reach the climax forest, I mean, to, in, in terms of environmental terms. And then you put the preservation laws on it. The climax forest has all the genetic material you need, particularly at its core. At the edges, it needs more material that comes in. And some of it may even penetrate. You know, from the edges, some little creature may actually come in and be very helpful. But mostly, they undermine the system. So what you have is a climax condition, and the architect should be asked, to get to demonstrate that all the genetic material that they use comes from Charleston. Okay, that's just a way to think about it, if it's in this area. Now, what will be the result? Because the architect will say, now I'll never be famous. <laughs> okay, because I can't express my genius, which is, by the way, what they teach in certain architecture schools. Uh, because they're only taught, you know why architects are weird? Just between you and I. No architect has ever, is ever shown a building in an architecture program that isn't designed by a genius and isn't a masterpiece. They don't see any normal buildings. And so they become deformed 
and the standard is the genius. And so every building is a chance at immortality. And it's usually at the sacrifice of context. Okay, and that doesn't work in Charleston. It just doesn't work. And one of the things that is a, 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 sub, a, a light motif and that I'm going to say here is, I'm going to say this, this is, the, this is a horrible thing to say, okay? The reason you should have turned down the Clemson School, which you did, is not because the building was incompatible, okay? Because actually, arguably, it was compa more compatible than many other buildings. It's because the intellectual curriculum of the school is incompatible. That's actually the problem. I mean it. This is a school that is trying to become world class, and to do become world class, you look at the world. And a school that's trying to become world class does not provincialize itself, rusticate itself into the small world. Okay? But you have other schools under different names. The craft school, the preservation program at the College of Charleston, the Riley Center for Community Development. You have all the seeds here to actually have a school to bring together into a school that becomes intrinsically a local school, which is actually what you need for this small piece of the earth. You don't need a, a would-be Harvard. Okay, now I'm going to say the worst thing ever. You thought that was bad. You would hear that Clemson has been here already for 27 years. Right? They've had a program here. Heard that. And the program attempts to have the students look at Charleston. If that is the case, why is the architectural situation after 27 years so hostile to Charleston that I have to be to come in and clean up a mess. If it had been, I mean it, if it had been a genuine attempt to understand Charleston and to teach the students not only to learn, but to provide, to learn the genetic material, and not just to be parasitic on Charleston, but to actually deeply understand and provide for Charleston's needs, I wouldn't be here. In fact, you might not even need a BAR, because it would have done its job. I do not think that Clemson is ever, that its charter is ever to become a small provincial school dedicated to Charleston. It isn't. Let it become the Harvard of the South, if you wish. <laughs> but you need another school. You need your own. And it need not be an architecture school, but it needs to be another school that pulls together the scraps of all this incipient stuff, including Mayor Riley, and makes a school that pulls together architecture, preservation, urbanism, a certain kind of urbanism, the kind of civic uh, infrastructure that you have here, the kind of landscaping, the kind of parks, the kind of environmentalism, which uh, uh, the Coastal Conservation League is pioneering in. You know, the Coastal Conservation League is about the only environmental movement I know that thinks that the way to preserve nature is to make cities so wonderful that people don't want to leave them. <laughs> Process that. <laughs> so instead of drawing urban boundaries and say, don't go out, they say, why would you want to go out there? Why would you want to live in a dopey suburban subdivision when you can live in Charleston? So it's totally integral. The Coastal Conservation Union is totally integral to this agenda. And if this were pulled together, I think that Charleston, instead of having to need to import architects from Charlotte and Atlanta and New York, like Bob Stern's coming all the time, Charleston will export architecture because it's much more 21st century what is happening in Charleston in terms of walkability, compactness, the way things are done here is really the future of the 21st century and not the glass boxes. It will actually become one of your greatest export items. It's really amazing, okay? Now, uh, I think that if I were Southern, I wouldn't be so explicit about all this. <laughs> but things, things, uh, things dissolve when I'm gone, so I'm trying to be very, very precise. Mm. Okay. 
Oh, because, and the reason I said that about the schools, is that everything that I'm proposing today is a Band-Aid. The protocols of the BAR, the architectural codes, Band-Aid. What you really need is architects who are of Charleston. From, I understand Charleston and are excited by Charleston. And I'm going to actually read, it's in the wrong place, but I'm going to read a Roman oath, which is very interesting. The mayor has a Greek oath. The Roman oath is quite different. Okay, so here's your zoning code. This is just to remind you what a fantastic disaster your existing, <laughs> your existing zoning code is. Uh, it requires, by the way, this zoning code and the process exterminates small developers. It is unintelligible to young, small developers. The process of three months and six months that it takes to get a permit can only be amortized by a very large project. And that's another thing to bear in mind. The faster you can permit a building, the lighter the process is. The more masticated it is so it can be swallowed quickly. It means that the small developers that can actually build three and six houses a year will be able to be active here. And at the moment, they can't. At the moment, it's too hard to get a permit, so you get big out-of-town people, and then you blame them for doing big out-of-town work. There's only one small builder left in Charleston, maybe two, that I've met. And they're all saying, it's too hard to get a permit. I can't make a living when it takes so long. So it's very important that in, in our proposals, and as you perfect this, that you also make it lighter and slimmer. And that's, that's another agenda. That's the other agenda I wanted to buy. You have to clean up your process to make it less. So you have this tremendous complexity. Now, when you write a code, this is something that I learned painfully. If a code tries to make everything better, inevitably it makes everything mediocre. Because there are intrinsically bad places and complicated places that can't be coded. You can't have a single sign ordinance that deals with a pedestrian environment on, on King Street and on a 65 mile an hour highway. It's just totally incompatible. And when you see these incredible complex sign ordinances or all this complexity all the time, what you're seeing is people trying to administer the whole world. Our theory is triage. Okay, triage is after you've had a war, which is essentially what, what the 21st, 20th century has been. It's a great war with tremendous losses of architecture and cities, you know very well. Entire cities are gone, whole streets are gone. You know, you've saved quite a few, but mostly they're gone. What you do, after a battle, you can't save all the soldiers, so the doctor comes in and actually pulls the ones that can still be saved, and it's called triage. You take a third. Because of the circumstances of the 21st century, you have to do a triage operation here. And part of the, our codes, what they always do is they say, this is best and it has to be held to the highest standard. And this is secondary, and this is tertiary, okay? And I've gotten a lot of, a lot of pushback on that. And I think it's infantile when people t have told me. Uh, and by the way, I'm afraid to say the mayor also says this, everything has to be excellent. You can't do that. Okay, theologically, the Garden of Eden had to be invented so we could be thrown out of it to explain why junk exists. <laughs> if we were in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't need codes, right? And we could do 100% excellence. We can't. There's a lot about this world that is blank walls, drive-throughs, parking garages, drop-offs, and ducks. One of the things that is astoundingly unsophisticated about Charleston is the way that some of your really bad frontages, like parking garages, are actually in your very best streets. Look at King Street. You know, you're having a good time, and suddenly there's a miserable parking garage. And that's because in the attempt, I repeat, to make everything excellent, you make everything mediocre. Because parking garages exist, blank walls exist, bad things exist. What you need to do is to allocate them. And one of the things we would like to do, which we, was not in our purview, but we began to do it, is to actually uh, establish a system of A, B, and C streets. And the A streets, absolutely nothing but the best. The B street, try very hard. C street, okay, that's where it goes. <laughs> but it is paradoxically, it's the existence of the C street. One of the reasons that Paris is such an exceptionally good city 
is that unlike London that brings in modern architecture everywhere, and it's very, very clear it's being lost, the character of London's being lost everywhere, pa what Paris did is they say we're going to preserve the, the Paris of Haussmann, and then we're going to create a place that's called La Défense, where the new incompatible anti-urban stuff, fully glass, goes. And that's where all the fantastic architecture goes. Some of it is very good indeed, but in Paris it would have been destructive. And that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of place for modern, innovative, wonderful architecture, but it is intrinsically incompatible with the historic area of Charleston. Here's something else that's incompatible. Campuses are incompatible. Okay? The campus, I can't write a code for a campus. There's too many different kinds of buildings with different setbacks. You have two of them. They're industrial areas. Okay? It's an industrial district. It's something else. If I write a code that makes the industrial district and the college right, it has to be so weak that it doesn't administer anything else. And then you have this new, these new campuses. Uh, is it here or here? Oh, th what is that one? That's the hospital. You can't code a hospital. It's really weird stuff that goes on in there. And by the way, it, <laughs> it's not flexible. You know, they have to do what they have to do. The operating rooms have this relationship to that, and that's the way it is. And you're not going to put a window in an operating room. It's just, that's the way it is. And they have tunnels and bridges and all that, so leave the hospital alone. And then over here, this area, I would also consider a, a district. This is the new one that's being built. Now, what's its name? Horizon. Horizon. Horizon is also a problem, but you already have a master plan, although the building I showed you was from Horizon, and you can see that the master plan is ineffective. Okay. You also don't have a master plan for Sergeant Jasper. Uh, Jasper? What is it? Sar Sergeant Jasper, which is why it's such a free-for-all, and you've asked the developers, guess right. Go away, guess right. Oh, I was going to say one more thing. The old days when a developer would go away, and I've heard already, we got them to go away, that doesn't happen anymore. You're too valuable. You can put, that's not me, you can put them off. <laughs> You can put them off, but they'll come back. In the old days, you could actually torture a person long enough <laughs> that they would say, the hell with Charleston. I'm going to go somewhere else. And you've done that. There is historical evidence you send people away. You don't do that. Anymore. They'll come back. So one of the things to do is to actually have rules strict enough that they know not to come here in the first place if they don't like the rules, or try to get it to work out. Because now, at least at the current value, they're more flexible than they will be in 10 years when this is going to be a Gold Coast. And every additional floor is so many millions of dollars in profits that you haven't got a chance to stop anything. And I've seen it. It's Miami Beach. There are many, many places that are too valuable and the developers will not negotiate and you immediately get into legal, into le legal tangles. So you have, you're almost at the last moment that you can actually prepare master plans but forget that you can get developers to leave. They'll come back like zombies. <laughs> so here they are. By the way, the parks obviously can't be coded. Uh, by the way, I don't think you should go around inviting outside landscape architects to do things when you have something like the Battery Park already that work perfectly, you know? And, in, and by the way, uh, this, uh, what's the park here? Um, Calhoun Park? Okay, that's really horrible. Uh, and apparently you brought two of the best landscape architects in the world to work sequentially, and you destroyed them. Uh, you did. I mean, when I looked at it, I said, oh, what a horrible park. And they said, well, this is L'Oreal. And I said, no kidding. How did you get him to do such bad work? And he said, well, <laughs> he actually quit. And then we said, then we got... Uh, Falk uh, von Falkenberg to come. Well, he's the top guy in the world right now. And you got him to do the worst work ever. So something's dysfunctional, but that's not my job to find out. Uh, but the parks, you will be getting other parks coming up, and I think some expertise on how to make a park that works for people and is of Charleston, the preservation movement should also develop. And it's not about the latest gimmick or, you know, you know how fashion also occurs. Now, one of the things that I mentioned was the College of the Building Arts. Amazingly, almost a unique organization, and an organization that, if it weren't for a single person, 
the person who runs it continually harassing me for the prior three weeks or three months, I don't know. Who knows it exists? It's unique. So you're looking for Charleston. You're looking for the character of Charleston. So the architects say, well, why don't I pick up a catalog from a prefabricated panel with the latest cool mauve colors? I'm not making this up. You can see the buildings that are the result. And they bring something that could be anywhere. You know, brick patterns that could be anywhere, prefabricated, stamped, metal, you know, uh, composites and so forth. We are not, we are disincentivizing that in the code. And we are explicitly incentivizing that the blacksmithing, timber framing, architectural carpentry, plaster work and stone carving and masonry from this school. If anybody comes in with this and says, this is being made, see this screen here, see this entrance, see this grill, see this gate, see this overhang, see this bracket. If they say it's from a graduate of this school, it's in. So it's How can that not be self-evident? How can there be such cognitive dissonance that those who know of this school consider it a jewel, and yet they permit architects to bring things from catalogs that are from international organizations that could be found anywhere? That has to be, and one of the things we've done in this, this new code is alert people of the obvious. These are the people who will understand Charleston. They're from here, they have studied here, they have a long tradition of ironwork, for example, that goes back to days of slavery. You want Charleston to continue being Charleston? Here is an absolutely integral part. In fact, this should become part of, by the way, when I say that a new school of design is required here, I don't mean an actual, necessarily, a single school, but a school of design in the sense that you might say the school of Florence. You know, in which you say there are people that actually are converging and working in parallel from a place, from the genetics and the culture of a place. So this is our try at what we consider, you remember the map you saw that's historic? This is our first try uh, to actually put out what we consider to be the first rate frontages. Now we're not going to say zones, because zones are the entire building. What really matters is how the building meets the street. And those who think that the entire building should be superb all the way around. You're thinking of civic buildings, like city halls that are seen all the way around, or like this museum, or you're thinking of modernist buildings that are seen from all the way around. But urban buildings, open your eyes, it's the front that matters. You see it all the time in King Street. And that's where you allocate your budget, and that's where, you, and particularly at the bottom, you allocate much more of your budget. That's what the pedestrians see. Right now, you're seeing a lot of buildings in which there are all these wonderful metal things on top, and the air architecture showing aerial photographs, and nobody sees that. It's all about the ground. So we're alerting people. We really care about the frontage, and the coding we have is along the street. So these are the first rate. This is the first rate frontage. You have to really take care. And now we're working on a map that says the darker parts require the most attention, the slightly lighter ones, less attention, all the way down into the suburbs, where, which presumably they require no attention at all. That's the triage. <laughs> People explicitly have asked us not to do this. They say we want it all to be excellent. I want to say, grow up, it's impossible. And furthermore, there are at least four documents over the years, historical documents and people that have attempted to make this differentiation. This is an idea that recurs. You know, we gotta make, there's a difference between here and there. There's a difference. And remember, it's not about letting the bad stuff be bad. It's about preventing the bad stuff from going to the good places. Think of it that way. Those parking garages on King Street should never have happened if you'd had this. They wouldn't even have thought about it. But right now, it's a crapshoot, and you actually get bad decisions. So this is a map that will be further developed, but needs to be adjusted by you. By the way, this is not in our contract, so it's your job to make it perfectly accurate. You know, because you can say here, well, look at this. This map's no good. Like, uh, uh, he missed that corner. Well, that's your job. <laughs> we're just, we're giving you the tool. You need to adjust it and tune it to those of you who need. Now, a couple of things that we realize. There, there are two things to, it's very important to bear in mind. It's, you know, planning and architecture, planning in particular isn't very, is, isn't very difficult. And there are a couple of things that you should take, you should uh, be able to take. One is, there is a difference between 
building type and style. Okay. The Charleston side yard house is a building type that comes in different styles. There isn't a Victorian, you know, the side yard house or the double house or the single house or the store or the commercial storefront. Those are building types and they come in different styles. The building type is more important to Charleston than the style. The styles can be found anywhere else. You can find Victorian architecture, federal architecture. What's important here is the type and the type consists, I'm sorry, I have the wrong. Okay, the type consists, it's a brilliant system of houses that are shallow to the street with the porches to the south, right? And they give, regardless of how large the house is, it, they in front the street in a very delicate manner. They also show the garden to the front and because of north side manners, they're very private. And in Charleston, you've probably heard me say, there's a perfect balance of a first rate public realm, i.e. the streets, and a first rate private realm, which is the rather private side yard. It's the best balance on earth. It's what makes Charleston great. And by the way, this type should be exported. It also has this tremendous variety because when you walk on this street, you're seeing a certain very vertical type. When you walk on this street, you're looking at things that look like rather grand villas. And when you walk on this street looking this way that doesn't have porches, you might as well be in Georgetown because there are no porches and you have little entries. So the paradox of this rigidity is that you have fantastic variety. It's so brilliant. It is, it is Occam's razor, the maximum result from the minimum means. It's absolutely remarkable. The fact that this is not recognized as primary is astounding. Okay? Now, this is obviously residential. And when you put them together, as you do in King Street, and you put them close together, you get the commercial buildings. You put a storefront in the front, and the little side, the piazza on the side, becomes the stair, and sometimes it becomes a tiny little store. Unbelievably cool. You know, a little store 10 feet wide, 12 feet wide. So you get the big store, the little store, you get the fire, and you get this rhythm. People say, oh, that rhythm of King Street. Don't forget to talk about it. That rhythm of King Street is actually the single house brought together so that the piazzas touch. Or, paradoxically, the garden is filled with another building. And so here you have, again, the fantastic discipline of Charleston. And by the way, even the churches are long and thin, and it's astounding how they're slipped in everywhere, absolutely compatibly, and you can only tell because of the steeple. Okay, well, you say, yes, we know how to do little buildings, and actually many architects of completely traditional mode and even more modern mode have always done very well with a small house. The problem is, they say, we don't know how to do a big building. The Mills House. The Mills House is eight stories tall, and it's a block long. And it fits right there with the delicate stuff. And I'll show you a picture of it yesterday, because you have no conception of how the Mills House, how big the damn thing is. And you also forget how many big buildings you have downtown. You cannot say that Charleston can't do big buildings. It's just you haven't looked. And in fact, what you're doing is looking at magazines and other cities and not your own city. So one of the main things I can do, because I've heard a dozen times, fine, fine, but we can't see the big buildings, is remind you, you have a type of big building. And what it is, it's a very, very large single house. You know, with a corridor, hotel rooms, and the porch is still to the south. And the front, this is a monster Mills house here, but the front is relatively delicate. It's completely brilliant. I'll show you more of that. So this is what we do now. We basically <laughs> say, well, we've got to do it bigger. And by the way, we can't do it the old way, but we'll, we'll cut the buildings. We'll have, we will articulate the buildings. We'll change the materials and pop in and out, etc. That fools nobody. That is absolutely kitsch. It's, it, is, it is artistic garbage to do this, and it fools nobody. You have to learn, if a building is long, do it. Don't hide it. Handle it by the details, the way the Mills House does. And I'm gonna show you how that's done, because you have the genetic material here. You can't do that. And even worse, this is what's driving everybody mad, is this. Okay, that's what's, that, that is what's happening 
all over in the north. And, and this is what gets dressed over and over again with panelization and different materials and slight setbacks and so forth as if we were idiots and we wouldn't see it. <laughs> For example, there's a double Marriott going up now north of King Street that is a masterpiece in trying to camouflage what is really a, an aircraft carrier. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can blink and not see it but it's perfectly obvious and it looms. While we have a building, by the way, that building is not larger on that side facade. That double Marriott is not larger than the, than the um, uh, what's the house I just mentioned? Mills. Mills House. That's what's amazing, so I'll show you. And by the way, here it is. You can take that program and make two Mills houses out of it. Okay, so I want to say, I don't want to hear, and you shouldn't put up with anybody saying, any more we don't know how to do big buildings. That's not true. It's not true at all. You know, Charleston knows exactly how to do big buildings. You just have to look and stop looking at magazines. Okay? And the big buildings, obviously, are the ends of blocks. And by the way, this is a typical A street. The A street gets the long front. The B street gets the, gets the, gets the short front, rather. The A, the first rate street. And the side street gets the long front, just like the Mills house. And that can happen by code. Now, here's something even the worst. This is a, this is a project by uh, Bevan and Liberados in which they take the worst condition, which is a big parking garage, a big horrible parking garage, and they actually line it with side yard houses like that. And if you must have a parking garage, see? You see the edge of the parking garage? Instead of putting what's called a Dallas donut finish on it, which is, you know, the continuous building that's sort of relentlessly wrapping the big parking garage. Instead of having that very hostile look, you can actually cut it into smaller houses, smaller apartments, and this is what you would see on the street. Now, I would recommend that you don't build very many more parking garages in the first place because they bring the wrong kind. By the way, the wrong kind is not because they're younger and poorer. The wrong kind are the people that drive. You've got to recalibrate what the wrong kind is in Charleston. You've always had younger and poorer people. It's the people who are the cars who drive that are killing you. And that's what you should do. So here you have, you have the existing Dallas Donut solution. You see with this continuous single corridor, which everybody understands is quite hostile, and here you have a liner building of smaller buildings to the front. By the way, this is an absolute, in an emergency, if you build a parking garage, this is what you do. Try not to build a parking garage. Okay, now because the architects are now saying, oh my God, this is exactly what I thought Dwani is selling us down the river. Because he's a secret traditionalist. Okay, and that's all he knows, and he snuck in. I'm not. I just do what works. I'm a contextual architect. In cleared areas of New Orleans, this is the single house that I designed. This is prefabricated. It's made by trailers. It has the plan of a single house. It is extraordinarily good. It's got the shade. It's got the shallow porch and everything. But the con there was no context left. And I thought that a mobile home actually would be kitsch. And you could obviate the problem with a mobile home. No one wanted, even the poor people in Charleston didn't want a mobile home. But if you dressed it this way, with that green moving panel and so forth, they liked it. Okay? So I just want to say, and this is designed by me, by my hand, every last bit. I can do modernism, but I also think that other things trump architectural style. I'm not an ideologue. And I want to make that very clear. Because people will say, well, we got the wrong guy. The architects will almost universally say, we got the wrong guy. But I'm not the wrong guy. I just happen to think clearly, which is a rare commodity. <laughs> and that's because I went to a really, uh, I went uh, to an architecture school that was in complete meltdown, and they taught me nothing. <laughs> so, which is why I had enough of an open mind to come here to actually learn from Charleston, because they had not, as it were, uh, screwed me up. Uh, okay, so these are some of the, of the tall buildings. Okay, this tall building is, I believe this is near the park, right at the battery. Let me count. It, first of all, it's up about three or four feet, very tall first floor. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven stories. Seven stories. Very big, a whole block face. What's the problem? Or let me ask, how did they get away with that? Well, a few things. The, no, it's not an egg crate of balconies. It's got a bottom, which is commensurate with the height of the building. It has a courtyard. This, it isn't just a little, a little change of material at the bottom. It's that tall. The windows are vertical in proportion. There's nothing expensive about this building. Nothing expensive about this building. This is the famous Mills house. Check it out. I mean, what are you going to do with that monster? Well, why don't we just put it on King Street? And everybody loves it and is grateful for it. You know when this was done? 1969. Now, why does it, why does it fit? First of all, there are two rules. By the way, this is, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight stories. Why does it fit? Number one, because, and by the way, it's a very low budget building. It really is a star of building. But whatever budget they had, they put on the first floor. Here's where all the ornament is. They made an allusion to the shading, which is a huge part of the Charleston expression. And then they used domestic windows with small mullions. Not glass things brought in from elsewhere, but just this standard domestic window, which brings the scale down and gives that texture. Everybody's talking about texture. We've got to buy texture. Well, why don't you buy a window with small mullions? That's got texture that's recognizable instead of having little panels, you know, little metal panels everywhere. And here you have this incredible building in the middle of the most delicate area, well loved. This one has never been controversial until it became the model for something else, and now it's a controversial building. But I don't think anybody objected to the syntax of the building. They objected to the height. And actually, I'm not going to argue that this park deserves this height everywhere, because it's not my job. But the park would be better if it were this height. What I'm observing here is that the bottom of the building, the taller the building, the higher the pedestal has to be. Okay, it's just like a boot. You know, it has to be commensurate with the body. And then the, t the cornice also has to be bigger. And therefore, sometimes when the building is tall, you have to take the whole top floor and make it a cornice. You can't have something that flow, you know, that is simply a bigger version of a cantilever. The whole top floor has to be different. So then you get a base, a shaft, and a capital, which is commensurate to it. Here's another one. Okay, here's another building that is, uh, let's put it this way, not at all miserable. You probably don't even know where it is because it's, it fits in so well, and yet it's another very eight-story building. This one also has windows that get smaller as it goes up. It has balconies, but not too many, and it's always the same rules. You know, the base is commensurate with the height, and the top, the entire top floor is the cornice. If an architect says, this is going to make Charleston dull, they're not good enough architects. You say, if you, if you can't work with this, which is the material of Paris, London, Charleston, New York City, and Boston, why don't you go work in the suburbs? Because you're really not good enough. Because anybody can pull this off. In fact, one of the things we did, I'll show you, was this. Okay, so these, this is the building that took six months to go Okay, this building took six months. There was a prior one, which is so indistinguishable, I didn't even want to waste a slide on it. So they, they submitted one building, and they said, go away. Think it, the second one came in, and they said, guess again. And then the third one came in, and this is what they got. And what the board said is, well, this is last Wednesday. I suppose we need to pass it. This is what we're going to put up with. And this is where I had to have two martinis that night with Kitty when I saw this event going in. So I told, uh, I to by the way, this is a weird projector. Everything's more vertical. Okay, all this is, the, the correct one is wider. I don't know why the aspect ratio is wrong. But uh, the building, in other words, this building's worse than it looks. <laughs> You're seeing it much slimmer than it really is. It's quite a fat lug here in my screen. Okay, so this is what you get after six months of the, of, the, of the BAR process. Excuse me. This is not working at all. Because you know what? Six months later, the first building that came in wasn't worse. It was virtually indistinguishable.
The architect was so demoralized that not only did he mumble his presentation all the way through and not even take his time, because it didn't matter. And then when they said, the people on the board said whatever they wanted, it wasn't stupid, but it was not very precise. And the poor architect was asked, sir, do you have anything to say? He says, there was, I think he might have been asleep. There was no, no, <laughs> no sound. It was an absolute funeral that I witnessed that day for one of the, the first building of one of the most important parts. So I said, Dylan, get this building. Okay, you have about six hours. Let's see what you can do. Okay, and that's what he did. Okay, sorry, let me, why is this not working now? Oh, because this is very heavy, right Dylan? Okay, let me go back. Okay, so what did he do? He took the exact same massing, he redesigned the very, cru the very crude grill that was out of date from some magazine when the, when the poor architect had been to school 25 years ago, right? That's what they did when you had no ideas. And Dylan, frankly, didn't have any ideas either, right? But he had ideas that come from Charleston which is you make a gallery made out of metal, which is what's here. He takes the big windows. Damn, I wish I, I cannot believe this screen. It, it's half the width, what you're seeing here. All the proportions are off. The building, it's, it's really twice as wide what, we're, what I'm looking at here. Anyway, so he does the small windows, he puts this, he puts the base, two stories, and he brings just one line, he, the top floor, by the way, was already taller. The architect had already made the, the top floor taller, which you may not have noticed because he used the same window slightly extended. Well, if he had actually used an additional window, we would have noticed that it was actually taller. And then he put one more piece of prefabrication, probably down here, it'd be nice if it were stone, up here it can be concrete, it doesn't matter. He picked up the cornice uh, from, the, uh, from the other building, and lo and behold, he got a really decent building, and even up close, it looks okay, right? That's a domestic window. This building cost less, if not much less, than the one that was being presented. So there's no excuse for not doing it. It would probably be nicer inside. You know what the problem is? A, that nobody thinks of doing this, and B, that the board does not feel compelled to tell the architect anything. They literally say, we're gonna give you all this vague stuff, go off, guess again. And so the guy picks up another magazine, this time ever more depressed, <laughs> and picks up another cliche in Charlotte and tells some kid in the computer to just do it. <laughs> and as an architect, I'll tell you that's exactly what you're getting. Instead of saying, we don't want you designing a building down here until you've settled into Charleston for two days, take your photographs, show us what you're doing, and if you don't take the right photographs, we're going to show you what the photographs are, and we're not going to show you a single photograph from anywhere else except Charleston. And so that habit that there is now of actually showing photographs from all over the world to the prospective architects, you're confusing them to do that. It's very, very confusing to the architects, and it's unfair because the people actually want this, and this is your brand. Okay, I'll tell you, this is Dylan half asleep doing this. Got it? <laughs> so this is not some, oh, oh, DPZ, you, uh, your young people are such geniuses. No, it's like an, a regular guy did this in six hours. <laughs> okay, so the new code. We wrote two kinds of codes, which we want to show you. And then the word came from City Hall that the mayor was really enamored of this, the Athenian Oath. Have you, all, have you all read it, this Athenian Oath? It guides the mayor. It's a very comprehensive code. This is what it is. We will never bring disgrace on this, our city, by an act of dishonesty or cowardice. We will fight for the ideals and sacred things of the city, both alone and with many. We will revere and obey the city's laws, and we will do our best to incite a like reverence and respect in those above us who are prone to annul them and set them at naught. We will strive unceasingly to quicken the public sense of civic duty. 
Thus, in all these ways, we will transmit the city not only not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. Okay, beautiful words. Very comprehensive. Very much the mayor. The last line is the relevant one to the, to the ARB. Okay, just the last line. The rest is about governance and, and civil duty and civic duty. We will transmit the city not only not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. And I said that, I said, well, that's too big to put on a building. And then I remembered that there's a Roman oath. And look at the difference between the two cultures. This is actually funny, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to read it twice because it's so amazing. It's slightly gender specific, okay? Like the Romans were not, they weren't there yet. He said, men do not love Rome because she is beautiful. Rome is beautiful because men have loved her. See that? It's fantastic. It reverses it. A lot of people come to Charleston because Charleston's beautiful. But Charleston is beautiful because men have loved her. And what I see now is that the architects are not loving Charleston. They're not. They're trying to make it something else. And if you really don't love this little place of four square miles, that should be identified. You should be identified and you should be outed. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how personally charming you are, your building is not considered to contribute. And by the way, never confuse the charm of an architect with their building. It's not the same thing. Some of the gentlest buildings I know are designed by sons of bitches <laughs> and vice versa, okay? So you have to look at the building and you ask, do you really love Charleston? Demonstrate it, you have to fit in. And by the way, if you really do a cool masterpiece just outside the four square miles, believe me, I'll be there for you. You know, and I'll visit it and I'll celebrate it. But it's very, very unlikely that we need a masterpiece here in Charleston, particularly in, in the fabric of Charleston. The civic buildings, you know, the, the, uh, the aquariums, the, the museums like this, the African American Museum, I wouldn't even look at the, I don't think the board should look at civic buildings. I think civic buildings should entirely respond to the artistic inspiration of the architect and to the aspirations of the institution that commissioned it. In other words, you don't look at churches, you don't look at, you know, they have to be to the max. If you take Harry Cobb's building, the African American Museum, and you say anything about it yesterday, you destroy it. You know, it is what it is. And that's the dialectic of the city. The civic buildings are allowed to be as they are, but the private buildings need to behave and be silent and contribute and not be masterpieces so that the civic buildings can show. It has to be hyper-contextual. You should be very suspicious of any building within the context that, uh, that is trying to stand out. Okay, now we wrote guidelines, and I'm not going to read these, but they look like this. Okay, just a few things that are important. Uh, okay, this is, what we're talking about is, this is the way Charleston has been built. We realize there are other ways to build, but in other places. Okay, it's not that we're complete provincials here. I understand there's other kinds of architecture that goes somewhere else. The other thing is there are general notes these guidelines are intended for civil buildings, private buildings only. The civic buildings are exempt. A rule act, and there are three, three rules. A rule activated by shall is mandatory unless applicant makes a compelling argument to the BAR. So you know, that's a shall, don't mess with it unless you want to fight. And then a guideline activated by should is recommended by the BAR. You want to have an easy time of it? Do the shoulds. An option activated by may can be requested, you know, so we have slack. And by the way, if it's not in any one of these, good luck, I hope you have six months. But this is not a very onerous code, it's very short. The other, w another format that we might do is this. These are the things that are desirable. Place-based responses, short setbacks, many small buildings as opposed to few large buildings, simple massing, complicated massing. Okay, this is what's desired. 
the more you stick to this, natural materials as opposed to composite materials, fewer materials, okay, bearing materials as opposed to cladding materials, clear glass as opposed to mirror glass, etc. This is easier to approve and this is harder to approve. We're not banning anything. You can, you can bring a, a glass box, okay, but you know you've been alerted ahead of time that you're going to have a harder time. So at least people know what they're doing. It isn't this, this fantasy, this charade that people from outside are going to come and they have to guess, you know, like, why don't you throw some spaghetti and see if it sticks on the wall <laughs> at the BAR room? Come on, that's really unfair to the architects, etc. And by the way, if you don't agree with this, don't take the job. We don't take lots of jobs that we don't agree with. We don't do suburban sprawl. What's wrong with not taking the job if you don't like what the rules are? And so, and it's only four square miles of this earth, so don't worry about it. That is not as precise. This is what we would have done. The, uh, the planning department, the, uh, the uh, architectural review committee wants more precision. We write the rules now like this, height, and then we give a purpose. This is the rule, this is the purpose of it. So it's defensible. It's still in rough draft. And then they come like this. These are the rules without the purposes attached. They're not that many, you see, but they alert. By the way, this is nothing like the Code of Seaside or nothing like the Celebration Pattern Book. This is very light stuff. This is the stuff that every architect in Charleston should know. It's just that they don't. And it goes like that, like that. And if you do this, it should really go quickly. One other thing is we've also rethought the board, those who know the inner working of the boards. First thing we want to do is split it into two boards so that it meets first and third week, second and fourth, so that the load of submittals are cut in half, so that their people aren't exhausted. And one of them is dedicated towards renovation and preservation, and one of them becomes, is actually staffed to be expert on new buildings. People who know how to deal with older buildings is not necessarily at all the same skill set as people with new buildings, and they should be split. And so you, it doesn't accelerate the process, but the people are less exhausted. Uh, we also think that the attorney should act like an attorney and not like an architect. Uh, the attorney on it, uh, there are different skill sets. And by the way, the architect shouldn't act like attorneys either. But what, is, what was very evident at the end of the presentation is that somebody had to summarize it, clarify and summarize what, the, what, what it was, what the conclusions were, so the architect would walk off with an idea. No architect walks off knowing what the hell they've been told because it's disparate. And the attorneys are really good at this. By the way, there was quite a few calls, get the attorneys out of here, you know, because they don't know what they're doing, they can't even read a plan, etc. The attorneys have a very important role but it's their skill set. So I would say that the board chair should always be an attorney, not an architect, and that that person should actually conclude what the sense of the meeting is. The architects should be of two kinds. There should be one that is extremely open to modernism, and when a modernist building comes in, you know, try to do the best you can within modernism, you know, within the limits. And traditional buildings, when they come in, don't try to exterminate the traditional building and make them semi-modern. So basically, there are two architects, and depending on the building that comes in, one or the other has precedence, so that the buildings get better. One of the saddest things is the number of buildings that came in, and after the BAR, both modern and traditional, and after the BAR experience, they came out worse. You know, and that's absolutely unforgivable, unforgivable, because everybody goes for the average. So what we want is two sympathetic architects in the board. We do need licensed professionals to keep the architects from floating off into theory. And it can be uh, a builder or an engineer. You know, somebody, there is an engineer present who actually is one of the more level-headed people. We need one of those. And then have alternates. Because it's very important that, that, that people recuse themselves. Recu recuse, right? Yeah. Recuse themselves if they have anything to do with that, and it's constantly causing a problem with, uh, with um, um, influence and so forth, and, and quorums, the quorums disappear. So we have all, in other words, this is stuff that, that's pretty evident. Uh, there is, uh, we, we're gonna smooth out the, 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 uh, the uh, 
presentation, like for example, every rendering needs to show equally well drawn the buildings of its context. You have to see it as the context. And it's not just to fit in, because sometimes the buildings in the context are miserable. And then it's okay to ignore them. But the architect has to render the buildings. By the way, the architect rendering the buildings adjacent would actually cause that architect to look at them, <laughs> which would be amazing. And then we don't want any more renderings from the air. We don't want any more renderings from an impossible distance. There will be two renderings required, one from the sidewalk right there, which will actually cause the architect to notice that it's a really miserable under-designed place that they're making which doesn't appear from the distance. You know, if the architect has to say, I want a rendering from the sidewalk, he's going to spend a lot of time making that sidewalk look good. The detailing, the materials, the mullions. And the other thing is no rendering should be any further than the other side of the street. Because if you do that, you get, it's not what you see. It's totally distorting. And it would actually inform the architect to say, ah, from the other side of the street, I don't even see the top four stories. Let me concentrate on the bottom. But above all, there's a lot of subterfuge, a lot of camouflage that goes on by the angle of the renderings. And so we say we want these two, these two kinds of renderings. And it's this kind of thing that we've learned in other places to do. We're going to make nice, clear application forms. Bureaucracies are become respected insofar as they look bureaucratic. And uh, so we're going to do some of that. And that is the last slide. So that's what we've done. Uh, some of it, oh, by the way, one last thing. Uh, this is the last, my contract says I don't have to convince you. <laughs> I just have to listen and make the best proposals. So now it's up to you, probably the preservation boards, the, the activists and so forth, to get this to happen. And uh, remember that there's only one little thing that I'm leaving behind. There are other big agendas, the new codes, the new regulations, developing a school of Charleston. All of these things can really profitably occupy you. And they're just as important as what we did, as what we did this week. So thank you very much.